So I'm going to introduce us all, first of all. We've introduced Renata, who's the whiz kid. Um, my name's Angela Walsh, and I'm an equine vet at Corner House Equine Clinic. I've recognised a few of your names, actually, that are registered, so hello to you. Um, I am a common garden equine vet. I do quite a lot of management. I quite enjoy surgery, um, so I might just chop off a few tumours here and there. I'm always out and about with my laser. I'm very keen on my laser. Um, but just because I enjoy surgery doesn't mean that I'm a specialist surgeon. It just means I'm a vet who happens to enjoy surgery. Um, Ollie has kind of taken it to the, uh, the, you know, to the limits on that. He's a vet that only does surgery. Um, and he works at B&W. I'm going to say that very slowly, B and W, because it does sound like BMW, which is a car that none of us can afford. Um, and he's a specialist surgeon, so that's quite different. And we're going to explore what that means, because I think it's really important. And then I'm going to ask you afterwards whether you know if you've got a specialist surgeon at your practice or a visiting surgeon. So, um I think that probably the best thing to do is ask Ollie, uh, you know, how, how did you become a specialist surgeon or how did you get into being an equine vet in the first instance? Because I think your parents were a bit disappointed, weren't they? <laughs> End, endlessly, endlessly disappointed. Um, oh, thanks, Angela. Well, um, yeah, so to be honest, getting into an equine vet, I was going to be a proper vet when I went to college and be James Herriot and, um, uh, you know, sort of trudge around Yorkshire and see cows. And I actually... I slightly come from a farming background, so my mother's family all, all farmed uh, there. We've been yokels for a long time. Um, but I was at college about 200 years ago in Liverpool, which um, when, uh, as it still is actually, has an amazing equine department and some really inspirational people used to work there. Sadly, um, some of them have, uh, it's so long ago, some of them passed away and, and some have retired, but uh, it was a truly fantastic place to, to be a a vet student and uh, became fascinated by horses. It always has something of an interest, but it was definitely not a not a big thing from the get go. Um, and then my some accident, so there was some sort of clerical error when I applied for a job in Newmarket when I left, um, and uh, and uh, unfortunately they got me rather than the person they wanted. So I had two years in um, what is now Newmarket Equine Hospital. It was good old Greenwood Ellison Partners when I was there. Uh, and that sort of set the, the, the die was cast from there. So my next job from there, um, again, I, I sort of stumbled into a, um, uh, a surgical training at the Royal Vet College. And that, that's really where I sort of did, did, my, did my surgery. So as, as Angela said, there, you know, most people who get into equine practice are... Um, yeah, and most people are general practitioners in the same way that you might go and see a GP um, as your first entry into the NHS. Um, the, the route to training as a specialist surgeon is very similar, really, to training as a, as a human surgeon in terms of the, the, the path that you take. So I did an internship at, in Newmarket. So I did two years there, which is sort of the equivalent as a, of a house officer's job in a, in a human hospital. And then I did three years as what... Uh, what we termed as a, uh, a resident, which is an American term. Um, interest, I, I discovered the other day, actually, that was, um, it, it, they call them residencies in America uh, because a very famous surgeon invented that because he expected his surgical trainees to live in the hospital and not leave. Um, and it was a bit like that. Sounds uh, good. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Apparently he was a, he was a, a, a um, uh, turned out that he was an alcoholic and a heroin addict, but that was back in the days when that didn't matter, apparently. He was, uh, but it was, <laughs> that was the 1890s. Um, so I did a residency, what to say, is sort of the equivalent of being a registrar in a human hospital. And what that allows you to do if you if you do the right training is to then essentially tick all the boxes that you need to to sit your what are called your board, board certifying exam. So to be called a specialist, um, you, you need to have a diploma. And there is now a there's a pan European body uh, called the European College of Veterinary Surgeons. Um, and that's the that sort of oversees the specialist surgeons in Europe. Um, in order to gain entry to that, you have to pass exams. In order to be able to sit the exams, you have to have done a residency and to have, have ticked the various boxes of um, uh, that you need to get through that residency. So you have to do a certain amount of research, which was never a strong point of mine. Um, <laughs> you have to do a certain number of cases and, and, and not just any old cases, but you have to, you know, it has to be a degree of complexity to them. There's a 
a list of types of surgery that you have to do. You have to do a, a, a good breadth and, and you are trained. Um, so you're trained by, you have to be trained by an existing diploma holder um, or as is often the case and certainly was for me, several different diploma holders who would all have their training in around the world in different places as well. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually, a, it's a fantastic way to, it's kind of all that knowledge that they've gained from, you know, some of my people who train me um, have worked in Ohio, Wisconsin, uh, Penn, and uh, as well as uh, in this country, the RVC, I picked up a lot from, from Liverpool as well. So all that kind of fed in. And as I think it's been talked a lot about actually um, in, the, in the press recently, you know, medical training, veterinary training is so international now. Um, we're, we're very lucky, you know, we can have these chats. There may be somebody watching this from, the other side of the world it's very easy to do um but it does all feed into your into your training so it's not it's not trying to remember what you learned as a as an undergraduate it's that you know most of what i do now is all sort of postgraduate training yeah and then having done that and and again um i pretend to be a to not be a computer whiz kid and actually managed to hack into the computers at the university of zurich and change my exam results so i passed that and um, and then yeah you're you're at least on the world as a, as a as a specialist um and then, of course, you know, that was, the, I, I finished my residency in 2002. Yeah, long enough ago, long enough ago, I can't really remember. Um, yeah. And then I've just been in surgical referral practice since. Very good. So that's probably why you're a bit better at surgery than me then, really, with all of that stuff. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, I was fascinated I, to know how many actual specialist equine surgeons there are in the country. And I was thinking there probably was about 30, but is that correct or? That's a very good question, actually. Uh, and I suspect you probably at some point asked me to find that out before I did this talk. And I might have forgotten to do that because I'm a surgeon and I can't remember to do anything. No, uh, this I is true. <laughs> Yeah, I think it might be slightly more than that. Actually, there aren't. There's not. There's not huge numbers, um, and, and certainly that are sort of busy in in surgery. Because once once you qualify as a surgeon, some people will then veer off into research, or some people become very much primary teachers. But yeah, I think it'd be a few more than that. My, okay. I have a quick guess. I, I would maybe near a fifty um, across across the, all the universities and the um, and and the. There's only only really a small number of large private referral hospitals. Yeah. Um, and I was just going to say, I didn't mention this earlier, but um, I know you obviously because you used to come and locum for us when you were 12, um, about 20 years ago. <laughs> That's what you looked like. You looked like you were about 12. But then laterally, um, I just wanted to explain for people who didn't know what CVS Equine was. Um, our practice, Corner House Equine Clinic, joined CVS Equine and you joined about a year before um, and I don't know whether people are aware of it or not because um, it's people haven't really heard of CVS Equine. It's very much in the background running everything. Um, and I just kind of wanted to explain uh, what the benefits were for us. And th the benefits for us were that we're all of a sudden now, rather than just being on our own, eight vets, you know, I think there's about 200 vets across 20 practices and there's loads and loads of specialists. So if I need someone to come up and look at a heart for me, I can get someone tomorrow, need someone to do surgery, just click my fingers, Ollie arrives. Um, so, I mean, it's brilliant. We've probably got about um, 10 or 15 specialists that can just rock up, um, look at stuff for us, sort stuff out for us, help us. Um, and horses don't need to go anywhere else now. And I know that you provide visiting surgery services to other practices. Um, where do you go just out of interest? Because you just go to CVS practices or do you go elsewhere to other CV other practices? No, I don't. So I, um, so yeah, we, um, we joined, so BNW, um, it was two practices that merged and then we, we joined CVS, must be nearly four years ago now. I lose yeah. track. Um, and um, uh, so uh, yeah no it's it, you know it's quite a big group of practices now so but so yes I do go to other CVS practices there's a, a lovely practice down in Sussex that I go to at, um, almost as friendly as Cornhouse no they are it's actually very similar <laughs> they're very very nice it's fantastic to go to go there um, uh, but I do go to other practices as well I, uh, there's a place down in South Wales which again is lovely to go to a few places in, in Dorset and um, in in Devon um, and a few further afield as well. Uh, so I've operated in Denmark um, and unusually in Iran as well. Wow. Uh, which was a, that was a good trip. 
um it was i was i was actually there teaching on a course and i, I got a, a phone call in my hotel room the phone just started ringing in my, in my hotel room uh, at about 10 o'clock at night and um one of the guys from the course said oh do you fancy coming and cutting a colic i was like yeah, why not not hadn't been much drinking going on in iran so yeah i was pretty sober and um yeah so i went and went and did a colic surgery which, which was brilliant it was uh, I, I saw something i've never seen in this country so uh, it was a uh, you know learning experience for me um, but yeah it's good really good very good. So I was going to ask another question now of our audience. Um, it says your bandwidth is a bit low, Ollie. So can you tell your children to get off the internet? <laughs> Just get off, get off Netflix. <laughs> Daddy's, Daddy's working. Um, we, we can still see you, but it just occasionally it's just pixelating a little bit. Um, and I'm sure that all your female fans won't like that. Yeah, no, pixelating's fine. That, that's what I'm doing at this end to keep the people interested. <laughs> yeah, I need some major pixelation, I can tell you. Now I'm 50, uh, so I'm hoping I'm very pixelated. Um, so, Renata, could we have another question, please? I was going to ask um, everyone, um, oh, if you've got a horse, has it ever had surgery at the vets other than castration? Because obviously that's quite common. Um, and I'm going to say no because mine hasn't. I'm going to say yes, because mine has. Oh, okay. Do Rest it. for colic surgery, that one. <laughs> so it'd be interesting to see how many people have um, experienced that from the client's point of view, because I think they do get really worried, you know, especially when the horse is on the table and they're waiting for us to ring. So, okay, well, that's interesting. It's kind of 50-50, but that's actually more than I thought it would be. Um so quite a few. So it might just be that people who have had a horse that have had surgery are coming to check you out, see if you're any good or not. And so the next question that I wanted to ask was, are people aware if they have, you know, a bog standard surgeon like me, um, so a GP vet who's probably quite good at surgery, or do they have the posh specialist surgeon coming to your clinic? And it might be worth you finding out. So let's if you want to fill that in, I'm going to put yes, because we've got Ollie coming to us. So I'm going to submit that and we'll see. Just be interesting to know, because I don't think people are aware of that. I might be wrong, but let's see how many people um, have a specialist surgeon at their practice. If you're with us, corner house, just say yes. <laughs> let's bump up the numbers. I, I said yes as well, because we've got some really good surgeons at our practice. Yeah, apart from you. <laughs> when, I, when I'm away. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Okay, so 28% are not sure. So I think it's worth finding out. You know, I wouldn't go down and complain and go, oi. But equally, it's nice to know, you know, if you've got someone operating on your horse, are they board certified or not? Because um, I wouldn't be going to my GP for an operation. Well, probably not. Maybe maybe a small Veruca, but I wouldn't be getting him to do much more than that. Um, so um, we're going to what I quite like to do, Ollie, is I've had a look through our records for the last year to see what surgeries we've done. You've done most often for us. And I picked out four. Um, two of them are quite similar. I've just realized. But anyway, we can spend more time on the others if you think they're more interesting. And for each surgery, I've got two questions to ask people because um, I'm getting really good at typing questions now. Uh, and the first surgery that I wanted to ask you about was um, what's colloquially called kissing spine surgery. And that was a sur that was something that was really fashionable, I'd say, about five years ago. Um, and we still do quite a few, but there was a peak, I would say, five years ago. Like every horse that was lame had a kissing spine. So, well, we didn't do that. But um, and maybe 20 years ago, no one had even heard of it. So it was kind of was a fashionable operation. I wanted to know, just so you don't have to keep coming back to me, um, what size do the horses show? What kind of horse are they typically? Um, how do you diagnose it? How do you make sure you're doing the right op? Um, what is the surgery and how has it changed? Because I've noticed that you're doing them differently from how you were for a, from us for us a couple of years ago. And um, what's the success rate? Um, so do you want to, shall we ask the question first if people have heard of it and whether they've experienced it and then you explain it or do you want to ask the question yeah. after? No, uh, yeah, why don't you I'll, I'll ask the question. And then, okay, and, so uh, can we have the next question, please, Renata? Have you experienced a horse that has kissing spines? And I'm going to say yes, because I've got a friend. Well, I've obviously, I've seen loads here, but personally, I've got a friend's horse who's got it. 
So it'll be interesting to see. I think it is something that a lot of people are aware of now. And if they're not, they will be soon. <laughs> so <laughs> let's see. Oh, wow. So 20% of people have actually had it with their own horse and 40% with a friend's horse. Um, and only 4% haven't heard of it. So, it, I, yeah, so it was quite fashionable, wasn't it? So over to you, Ollie. Um, I'm just going to warn everyone that some of the Ollie slides, I was having a look at them earlier, and they're like a little bit gory. They're not terribly gory, but if you are of that... I'll give you the, I'll give you the heads up before they get too gory. Yeah, it might be worth going and get a glass of wine at this point if you don't like it. So over <laughs> to you, Ollie. Right, so I'm going to do the classic thing of saying I'll share my screen. Um, let's see how that goes, and hopefully, right, okay, there we go. So, oh, if I did click on through, so obviously, you know, back, back problems are, it, it's, it's a huge issue, and um, we, we're just going to skip very lightly over it, just maybe keep an eye on, on the time, I do have a tendency to waffle, so We'll just talk very specifically about kissing spine. There are lots of other potential issues, but just to give you a little bit of an idea um, if the video is going to work. It is. Okay, so this is this is actually quite a long time ago. So I'm, I, I'm guessing 10 years ago because this is a, the school at our hospital, which is now completely surrounded by trees. You can see that this is actually it's a good horse. It's, this is a two star horse. As far as I can remember, she was about 12. And, you know, she's pottering around doing a bit of a, an impression of a pony clubber. Um, just you see the tail just constantly flagging and if you if you watch with my appalling video technique she's quite often just ears just going back every now and again you think she's a bit lame in front it's a bit short striding behind it's just a little bit uncomfortable you know nothing nothing huge in fact after I stopped filming it, she did do some proper bucks and rears but she is you know just doesn't really look like a horse that's ready to go and do two star just a bit grumpy a bit of a rocking horse canter and these will often have they'll, they'll often start to have problems with canter and then get um, progressively worse down the um down the gates from there so then get have problems with spot and then start start having problems with um uh, with walk and sometimes they you know just getting on board is dangerous um and, and other times it's really subtle and uh, you know you really kind of struggle and at least until you see the horse ridden to really appreciate what the problem might be um so we'll just skip on so that was before we had done a nerve block now this is the whole exact same horse about 15 minutes later and what we've done is injected some local anesthetic around the site of its kissing spines um and all of a sudden you can see actually that's that's a horse that can really do a lot better than it was doing before and the only difference is it can't feel that site in its back just drops nicely into canter very relaxed tail, ears pricked, dropped into an outline. You know, everyone's happy with that. And it's, um, so that's, you know, a condition that can look very different, hugely variable, but that's the kind of the classic of what we're, of what we're looking for. And as I say, sometimes you, we don't get to see this because they, oh, flying change. Um, they, because nobody's going to get on board because they're just dangerous. Uh, and that's certainly, you know, the other extreme. So that's you know, just to give you a little idea of what we're looking at. Um, and then what is kissing spines? Well, this is a horse's back, obviously with a horse's skeleton held up next to it. You can see how they get the shape of their withers. So each vertebra, actually I think if I click onto the next slide, here we go. Each, each vertebra has a dorsal spinous process um, and they're just much longer in horses than they are in us. So um, if they, yeah, they're particularly long at the withers um, and, and then you get down to this area, uh, they're somewhat shorter. Now they should be nicely spaced. Bone was never really designed to rub up against bone unless there's cartilage between it and a joint. And uh, when you get, when you, the, the classic description of kissing spines is that you've got bone rubbing against bone. And because this is the inside of the curve right under the saddle, as they get a little bit older, these will tend to, uh, unfortunately, all of us will learn in time that as you get older, things start to sag a bit and their backs are the same. Um, Renato will probably have spotted that this horse also, th this, this spine came from a horse that also has some unpleasant lesions in its joints here. Um, but this is what we're talking about up here is just it is bone grinding against bone at this point up here. In terms of which horses we tend to see them in, um, thoroughbreds are hugely overrepresented. So it's, it's not at all uncommon to see these in horses that have been in training, not because they've been in training, but because they are thoroughbreds and thoroughbreds seem to have a, a predisposition towards it. This is what we see when we x-ray them. So 
if you uh, remember what we looked at before, um, so dorsal spinous processes, dorsal spinous processes, nice gap here, not much space here, getting pretty chewed up here. And then you start to see this really sort of punched out appearance here. And the reason for that is you've got a lot of bone reaction where um, the, the whiter stuff means that the bone is thicker, the blacker stuff means that some of that bone is being resorbed. So it's a real, rather than a nice smooth outline that, that you've got, it's rather reactive, a bit like, a, it ends up looking a bit like a sort of a lump of solid cotton wool where um, those two bits of bone are grinding against each other and, re and reacting. In terms of diagnosis, Obviously, we're going to x-ray them. Um, and one of the issues that we have with horses is our ability to image horses' backs is, is a little bit rudimentary. Um, so we x-ray them. Um, bone scan can be really useful. Um, and ultimately, deciding whether this is causing the horse pain, what we do is this is, this is a, uh, a long needle here. It's actually two long needles, one either side. And we just inject local anesthetic down at the, uh, the level here. Now, the spinal cord is here. So all the nerves coming up from that to, to tell the horse whether this bit hurts, have to get past this, this blob of local anesthetic here. And so if we inject local anesthetic here, then the horse can't feel what's going on here. Um, so that's how we diagnose it. Um, in time, hopefully not all that long, we might be able to do CT scans of that area. We have a huge CT scanner at our hospital, but it's not big enough to get that part of a horse into. Um, and sadly, MRI is completely out of the question as well. Whereas you know, if you or I or a um, a dog or a cat uh, has a back problem we can MRI those we can't I can't I wouldn't have a clue what to do I can't spell cat but um, but it's just not a, that's not an option with horses so there are various treatment options um, you can inject some steroids around those and uh, which are very potent anti-inflammatory you can also uh, work with a physiotherapist to try and rebuild the strength of those muscles so that they can essentially hold their backs um, more comfortably so rather than being all squeezed together they can actually keep those bits of bone further apart. Um, some people have used Shockwave, which is probably just a low grade painkiller and a really active rehabilitation. We will quite often see these develop either after the horse has had time off for another reason. And um, presumably that's just because they're, the muscles of their back get weaker. Um, or sadly, often after a horse has changed hands, don't mean to panic anybody, but it is one of the things we see quite often, even in horses that have been vetted and absolutely perfect. They change hands and they just managed in a different way. That's not a criticism of before or after, but they are managed in a different way, ridden differently, and that can be a trigger to, to start this being a problem. Now, if you are dealing with these in, in young horses uh, in particular, and horses that are become unmanageable by, by other methods, um, oh, sorry, I should be warning, that's a bit of a grizzly one. Um, the, um, the, the horse is, um, you know, one option for resolving the issue rather than managing it is surgery. Now, this is what surgery used to look like. That incision there, what we're looking at there is a horse lying on its side. The, um, this, is, this is its back here. These are great big spreaders here with a great big long incision. It's about 30 centimetres long. And what you're looking at there is the tops of individual dorsal spinous processes. And what we used to do is to cut those off so that I just knit back to here. So we would essentially take the top off every other process. So you had this huge gap in between them. And it was pretty brutal. It involved general anesthesia, uh, which you know we do a lot of, but it's if you can avoid it, that's great. Um, and it, um, uh, you know, it had its place, but it was, it, say, it was pretty brutal. Um, what we do now is, this, this is what we start with. We aim just to um, nibble a sliver of bone off the front of each process that's, that's impacting the one in front of it to create space where, where there isn't normally space. And this is what we aim for as a, as a post-operative thing. Um, what that actually looks like, um, this is normally a one person job. Uh, this is a, a friend of mine who was doing his surgery training with us. So uh, he, he's learning. Um, and what you can't see there is you do have to stand on a step. This horse is just sedated, which is all they ever are. This is in our x-ray room um, where I just freestand them. Uh, very nice at Corner House today. We, were, we have them in the stocks and that keeps them perhaps a little bit more still. So anybody who is a little bit squeamish, maybe look away for 20 seconds ago. I'm just gonna play you a little video of, of uh, two little videos actually of what the surgery looks like. We start off with our spinal needles in place here and we take an x-ray like this to say, are we in the right place? Because it's a very small incision, you have to make sure you start in the right place because if you're in the wrong place, then you've, you've got to make a bigger incision to get where you need to be. And all we're doing there is cutting through the skin. This is, this is a live horse and you can see how much they're reacting. Not at all, not moving at all. Uh, the camera person seems to be swaying a bit, but um, that's because they're at a, at a great height. So a little one centimeter incision there. 
And, uh, and what we've done there is just to cut down through the ligament underneath the, the skin and just kind of create ourselves a little space here to get our, our instruments through. Then we'll just create a channel next to this bit of bone here, actually that bit of bone there, because there's a spine needle in it. And then we introduce our little chompers, um, which aren't so little, and then we just grasp that bone and just cut a little section of bone away and away you go, that's it. And then we're gonna keep nibbling down. We're just having a little feel to feel that we're in the right place. But what we also have to do is actually take quite a lot of radiographs because, so take x-rays to monitor what we're doing, ensuring we're in the right place, making sure we're not leaving any little bits behind, making sure we've removed enough bone that we've got space there. Um, and then we move on with the next one. Um, and so that's, that's sort of what kissing spine surgery looks like these days. There are quite a lot of variations on the theme. That's what we do. In terms of um, outcome from that, um, so we followed up the first 120 we did like that a good few years ago now. In fact, Luca was in that picture, followed that up. And essentially about 77% of those will do fine and go back to work um, if they don't have other orthopedic problems. And, and other orthopedic problems, unfortunately, some of these horses are you know, getting on in years and so have a few wheels coming off. Um, and obviously, if you you know, lameness issues added into that, um, the, it slightly reduces the probability of the horse coming back to work because obviously they've got more things to get past. Now, in terms of the rehab afterwards, um, they, they're generally, certainly compared to how they used to be, they're very comfortable after surgery. Um, they have five days of, of uh, butte and we don't give them any antibiotics anymore. We just, just treat them with, uh, with some painkillers. They have four weeks of box rest and walking. Those little incisions are just closed up with staples that we take out two weeks after surgery. We ask for them to be fed from the floor so they get their head down and, um, and, and, and uh, start to stretch their, their necks down and stretch their backs. And after their, their box rest and walking exercise, they get turned out uh, for six weeks. Uh, they lunge in a Pessoa or Equiband or Equiami. They, uh, we ask that they uh, have a physio consult uh, and we very much leave the physiotherapy to the physiotherapist because they're, they're, they're good at that and that's sort of, they're much better at that than we are. And, and it, I really, I don't have strong feelings about what physios should do because I think we don't really know and they are very good at working with individuals. So I, I certainly don't, uh, don't try to be too prescriptive. And then 10 weeks post-surgery, you, you put the saddle back on and away you go and you get them fit because they won't be as fit and strong as a, as a normal horse. There'll be lots of small muscles around their back, which will, um, which will be underdeveloped having had that back pain. Um, and so it's just a, you know, you're gradually getting them fit from there. At, a, at a, an absolute canter, that's essentially kissing spine surgery in a, in a nutshell. Brilliant. Um, I must say, Ollie, you made that sound easy and watching you operate today, you make it look very easy as well. Um, but that's, that's just a sign of a misspent youth. Spent far too much time. <laughs> it's, much time. But you know, it's actually, it's actually, I think, really tricky surgery. But you did make it look very easy today. Um, someone's asked a question here. Um, Sarah said, "Could a horse not being comfortable when the girth is being done up potentially have a kissing spine problem?" So. Yes, potentially. That that's one of those uh, one of those uh, in some ways slightly annoying signs from our point of view. It's what a, a colleague of mine, he's a, one of our medicine specialists, who did his training in Virginia. Um, he was a, a housemate of mine at college, and, and we we work together now. He he uh, they had a saying for those in Virginia, which was AQRs or ain't quite right, uh, and that's very the the resistance to girth tightening is a real sign of an ain't quite right. And so absolutely, that can be a sign of kissing spine. It can be a sign of stomach ulcers. Um, bizarrely, it can be a sign of problems in the neck. Um, it can even be a skin lesion can cause that. So it's a, one of those rather annoying signs. It's very easy to see that's what that's what makes them uncomfortable. It can be challenging to find out exactly why they, you know, what it is that's bothering them. Um, I was just going to say we we didn't make this clear, but if anyone else wants to ask questions, we may run out of time, obviously. But um, do just type them in if we've got time, and if um, he doesn't rattle on too much. We'll <laughs> we'll, try, we'll try and get them done for you. Um, I, I, I think I Angela doesn't need to sound, sound rude. I did say she can interrupt at any time, but I'm just waffling. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> um, I must say, when horses come in for kissing spine surgery at the practice, which they do quite often, I'm always, it's one of the surgeries that I really like because people are always really happy afterwards. They ring up after three months and they've got a different horse. I'd say 90% of the time people are delighted. So it's one of the surgeries that I I love doing not myself but I love having in to do because it's it's 
it's good, isn't it? We have, they have, we have really good results. So we're going to move on to another surgery now. I know it's a bit, a bit of a whistle stop tour, but if there's anything you're particularly interested in, hopefully you can do a bit more research. Um, so I was wondering about the other one that we did, and we've done one of these today as well, is it neurectomy and fasciotomy for um, hind limb suspensory desmitis. Try and say that when you've had too many wines. Um, so I wondered... Can you do the same again and tell us what type of horse, um, you know, what, what the signs are, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll give you a five minute warning. OK. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, yes, yeah, suspensory disease, it's, it's another of those things what horses do. And, and actually, it's one of those conditions that I often liken to tennis elbow. You know, if you're a tennis player, you've got a reasonably high chance that by playing a lot of tennis, you will get tennis elbow. If you're a horse and you do sporting stuff, there is a reasonably high chance that you will get a suspensory injury. And obviously, in the grand scheme of things, not huge numbers of horses get suspensory injuries. But of things that are going to go wrong, this is definitely one of them. And it tends to be a sport horse thing, generally a larger horse thing, and often a dressage thing. Um, now, just a quick review of you know what is the suspensory ligament um yeah, this is a, a picture on the screen here this is one of our nurses who's a a, a very accomplished uh, endurance rider um and i just want to zoom up actually so this this is a, a zoom of this and in fact it, obviously we're looking at the front leg but if you look at this th this horse is going to run 100 kilometers and look where its fetlock is at the peak of weight bearing um the fetlock is almost on the floor now the job of the suspensory they've got one at the front or one each on the front legs and one each on the hind legs. The job of the suspensory comes off the back of the cannon bone up here, comes down and attaches onto the back of the fetlock uh, onto some little bones here and some more ligaments go underneath there. And they are what stop that fetlock from hitting the floor. Um, and so it gets a lot of work. You know, this, this is a little um, uh, Arabian that's, that's used for endurance. And so, uh, you know, it's probably 450 kilos, which is actually even after lockdown slightly heavier than me. Um, but a lot of these will, uh, you will see these in, you know, 600 kilo dressage horses. And, uh, you know, those of you that, that do dressage or watch dressage, if you think of the size of their movement and just how much they exert themselves and how, how heavily they land, they look lightly, but essentially you've got probably 600 kilos falling from a height of ah, one or two feet as they're, as they're coming down. So they really, really work those uh, those suspensories hard. And so it's almost a surprise that they don't all damage their suspensories rather than that quite a few of them damage their suspensories. Um, in terms of what we've always done, we'll, we'll skip over diagnosis for, for that, which isn't, isn't always easy, but we'll skip over that and assume that uh, your unfortunate horse has got a suspensory injury. And essentially, up until relatively recently, um, certainly when I first qualified and when I was first uh, doing stuff, th there was only conservative management. There was no option. Um, and we're actually really just going to talk about hind limb suspensory. If you had a, if you had a choice, um, somebody asked you the question, would you rather have a forelimb or a hind limb suspensory injury? Take the forelimb every time because a, a really good number of those will simply get better. They need some rest, some controlled exercise, bish, bash, bosh, away you go. Hind limbs are quite different. We'll come on to that in a minute. But... Essentially, what we would traditionally do is give them six weeks of box rest, gradually increasing their walking exercise in hand or under saddle, and then re-examine them. If they were sound by that point, we'd start doing some trotting, gradually build up the trotting exercise over the next six weeks. And if they were still sound, they'd start some faster work, and then about 15 weeks after, they'd, they'd crack on. Um, so that was all nice, except that high limb suspensory injuries rarely did very well. Um, and there's a good question as to why. So um, uh, there's a bit of technical language here, compartmental syndrome. So what we have here is an image that is taken of a, of a post-mortem specimen. This is essentially a, um, a very clever Frenchman who has fixed this so and then sawn the horse's leg off uh, just below its hock. So this is the back of the cannon bone here. There's a splint bone either side here. Um, and then this structure here is the suspensory ligament. And what's really important about that is that behind it is this thick band of tissue. So in a minute, that, that, and we call that, that tissue fascia. And in a minute, we'll talk about cutting that fascia. And the reason for that is, unfortunately, if this ligament swells, all it can do is fill that locked box more tightly. Um, and that has a number of issues. One of which is the nerve that supplies it, so that it tells the horse what that, that structure feels like, is also in that locked box. And so that gets squashed and crushed. And, and if you think how uncomfortable it is to bang your funny bone, what you're actually doing is whacking the nerve around the back of your uh, elbow there. So that's a single trauma to your nerve. 
this is essentially slowly getting squeezed, which can be very uncomfortable and it can cause permanent damage to that nerve. So that's one of the reasons that high nerve suspensories don't often get better just left to their own devices is because the nerve itself is damaged. The, the other thing is in, in here, um, it's actually, we call it the suspensory ligament. It's actually, its proper name is the third interosseous muscle. I will be testing you all later on that. Um, and what's relevant about that is that the, the muscle tissue in there is also significantly more likely to be damaged than the ligament tissue. And the muscle tissue doesn't make it any stronger, but it is part of what it does. Um, and that, so that is also damaged by it. Now there's, there's a little bit of a theory that the healing process itself as with human Achilles tendons, the ingrowth of blood vessels might also be painful. Um, and, and so actually the healing process may also contribute to it staying painful. Um, what's good about this is that what it means is that when you've got an injured structure, it almost never breaks down completely. Uh, unlike horses, flexor tendons, which where you can get a catastrophic failure, it's really quite rare for that to happen. Um, and that is actually important when, when we come to, to talking about treating it. Um, we'll just skip on because I'm whiffling. Um, conservative treatment, um, what, we, certainly what we started way, way back when I was doing my residency at London, we, we, um, we, we added in the shockwave to uh, the rest and control exercise. And that certainly can make some of them more comfortable um, and can improve your success rate with conservative management. Um, and probably that's just a painkiller. Um, it, it may be no more than that. Um, there was a little bit of evidence that it might improve the, um, the, the formation of scar tissue to kind of strengthen that a little bit. The thing that we've added in um, since then is steroids to that treatment. So essentially, I'm just going to jump back a picture. Essentially, if we if we inject steroids into this lockbox, that they're very potent anti-inflammatories. So you get rid of some of that swelling take the pressure off the nerve, take the pressure off the muscle. And, and often that will make them much more comfortable very quickly. Um, and if it's something that's just happened, uh, that sometimes that's all you need. We'll get a lot, I'll, I'll only mention this in passing, I'll, there's a, I'll been a lot of talk over the last few years about using things like stem cells and platelet-rich plasma, basically bits of horse that you take out, do stuff with and shove back in again. And there's, a, in this situation, I think the evidence is that it probably isn't very helpful, but uh, you know, it is an evolving, uh, an evolving sphere. Um, what we're really just going to talk about very quickly is the surgical technique for this, which, and it sounds like a mad idea, you've got a, got a damaged ligament, but we cut the nerve that supplies that ligament. And in cutting that nerve, what we're doing is actually two things, well, three things really. One of which is they can't feel it anymore, so it's comfortable. But it's very important is we're not just making it pain-free so they can just carry on and keep breaking it apart. The nerve itself is damaged tissue, and that is painful. The other thing that we do is if you cut the, the nerve supply to a muscle, that muscle will wither away to nothing. Um, and that's what happens at the, at the top of the ligament. So what you all, you get rid of that muscle tissue that's in there, which is damaged, and you all, because of that, the ligament shrinks. So there is more space there, uh, which may improve the blood supply. It may simply be that you're getting rid of all the damaged tissue and taking the pressure off so uh, to facilitate healing. Now, it's a, it can be a very successful um, procedure. Uh, about 90% of horses that have this will come sound in the short term. And you always have to remember with statistics is that if I say it's a, you know, a million to one chance that this won't work and you're the one, then that's pretty depressing. Um, so 90% is great, but it does mean that not every horse does well with it. Um, and then 75% of horses will stay sound in the long term. And again, that's a slightly tricky figure in as much as what does long term mean? Uh, we've certainly seen plenty of horses now that have, you know, been, that are still going. Uh, the, the, as far as I can remember, the longest standing patient I have that's had this will be 17 years post-op. He's obviously retired now. He was quite young when he had it. Um, he, he's retired from being a dressage horse. But, um, you know, they can go on for a long time after this. Um, um, Ollie, can, yes. sorry, sorry to interrupt. Could I? Um, uh, someone has asked a really good question. Actually, um, can horses compete after neurectomy? Um, are there yes. certain disciplines they can and can't? Yes, they absolutely, they can't race, um, so they can compete after this neurectomy. They can't re compete after having a front foot neurectomy or a, a foot neurectomy. What the ruling says now is that you can't compete a horse that has had its skin sensation altered. And that was changed very specifically to make this legal. 
uh, we, and the reason for that, it, again, it's not just about making yours comfortable so it can keep working. It's about treating the condition and removing damaged tissue. And it's, uh, there's no question that this, um, uh, that this procedure has allowed thousands of horses to continue in work. And there's no question that, you know, plenty of those would have just been wasted, which, of course, you know, for some horses means they can go off and be a broodmare or whatever. But there are also a lot of horses that would ultimately end up, you know, being euthanized because they're quite big to be lawnmowers. And the FEI, uh, amongst others, recognised that, uh, that it was, you know, it was genuinely, it, it wasn't, it didn't have some, lots of the complications and risks of the other types of neurectomy. It's a treatment, not just a, a way of making it pain free so they can carry on. Yeah. Um, do you, Renata, do you think we could launch another question now to see how many people have um, had experience of hind limb suspensory desmitis? Because again, it's one of those things that I hadn't even heard of 15 years ago. Um, and then 10 years ago, everyone had it. So um, I'm going to put no, my horse hasn't had it. Uh, so it'd be interesting to know what the, if people know a lot about it. Let's just see. I think it is it is interesting. We, we're, we're definitely better at diagnosing it, which is part of the reason we see more of it now. But there are, there are a lot of, you know, really good, really experienced vets who would say that are even older than us that would say that it's much more prevalent these days than it used to be and almost certainly that'll be something to do with the way that we manage them um the, the, the critical thing is working out what it is that we're doing differently yes yeah, anyway, so we, we keep the horses a lot longer um well my horses won't ever get it because i just trot around on the forehand all the time i find that's great for uh, stopping those sort of problems um yeah so 43 percent either have a horse that's had it or they know someone that's had it so it is obviously quite common um ollie because we um haven't we, we haven't got loads of time left um it's flown so fast um i wonder do you think we should do the next two subjects together so the annual ligament yeah, the arthroscopy because they kind of go together almost don't they yeah, sure. Do you want me to just crack on? Yeah, I think so, because it'd be a shame to miss out if someone specifically wanted to see the... I think the annual ligament one is really interesting, and then we could just talk about the arthroscopy. Yeah, um, so so it's en essentially what we're talking about is... Our, it, it is arthroscopy. We're, when we're talking about doing a, uh, dealing with an annual ligament, that's uh, we're, we're talking about two seconds. That, that's essentially a ligament a ligament injury in the, in the tendon sheath. I'm going to start this, actually, just to... Just to um, so this is a, a horse, in fact, this horse is having a, a keyhole surgery on its tendon sheath, which, and part of the issue with that is that it has a damage to its annual ligament, which wraps around the back there. And um, this bit isn't particularly gruesome. Um, the next video is a little, you might want to look away for 30 seconds when I start the next, or 20 seconds when I start the next video. What we're doing is, is injecting sterile fluid into the tendon sheath to essentially blow it up before we start surgery, so inflating it so it's much easier and safer to get into. And what we're then going to do is to pop a camera, make a small incision and pop a camera into that. And that is essentially, that is the essence of keyhole surgery. We, we call this tenoscopy because it's in a tendon sheath. If it's in a joint, we call it arthroscopy. And what it's worth, if we put it in a navicular bursa or a, another bursa, it's called bursoscopy. We're not very inventive. You have to keep it simple for surgeons. Um, evolution has passed us by. But essentially what we're doing is we're inflating that, that tendon sheath and use the same technique for, for looking into joints. The next thing, so this is just a little bit, not too bad, but we're making a little incision here. So uh, we, right where we put our needle in, we're just gonna make a little incision, just big enough, it's about a bit less than a centimeter, just big enough to um, get our camera into. You can see a little bit of fluid leaking out from there. That's the fluid we've just put in there to inflate the sheath. And then we will go on and, and I think we're really done. Okay, so the, we're starting with the, the, the issue of the annual ligament. This is our camera looking from just below the tendon sheath, uh, sorry, just below the fellock here, at the back of the back of the fellock here. We're gonna put a camera in here. In fact, I will show you that just so you can get it, just to orientate yourself. We put a, a, a tube that the camera goes through, um, just pop that into there. And although it looks like, I noticed this earlier on, it actually looks like I'm sort of taking a big run up of this, actually we've been, really quite careful because tendons are very are very delicate and very soft so it's a it's a curved end on that and we're essentially introducing that looking up underneath uh the, the little bone on the outside of the fellow there so that is the view that we get what we have here this is the uh that the the back of the tendon sheath at that point is made up of this annular ligament 
This is the superficial flexor tendon, and this is the deep digital flexor tendon here. And what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm in fact, I'll start this running because it also goes on a bit. What I've done here, this is a um, this, uh, this sort of needle that you would probably see uh, one of your vets come rock up with and uh, you know give your horse an IV injection. It's a 20 gauge needle. So that's the amount of space we've got. This is a really important structure that doesn't want blades stuck into it. What you just saw coming through there, now I've positioned that is a, a blade coming through to make another hole so we can put our instruments through. So uh, as I say, there, there really isn't a lot of space there. Um, this is, uh, as I say, just being very careful. Now it looks like I've gone nuts and I'm making a massive hole. Actually, it's, it's hugely expanded. But what I'm doing here is cutting this annular ligament. One of the issues that we that horses have is sometimes primarily they will strain the structure. And um, because every time they take a step, that ligament is just being tweaked like that. And so they tend to get thicker and thicker and thicker. And, and it's very difficult for them to recover just by resting because just walking around a the box, they'll just keep tweaking that. What I'm doing here is just introducing a hooked blade. Again, bearing in mind, this is hugely magnified. Um, it's not actually some sort of samurai sword. Um, and then we're cutting that. And the reason for doing that is this, this ligament is, is injured. If we take all the tension off by just slicing down it, then those, the, the two ends there, slightly, I suppose, counterintuitively, then there's no tension on them. So those can then heal. What we're also doing, often more importantly, is taking the pressure off these tendons here, which can get quite constricted. It's very similar to um, carpal tunnel syndrome in people. It's exactly the same technique in many ways. Um, you can see here, actually, the, the annual ligament carries on up there. I will just let it run just for a little bit longer uh, because we, we do the same. We just slide that up there. There's a little uh, tiny sort of bit of tissue hanging out here because what I want to do is then just talk about the other structures that can go a bit wrong within the tendon sheath. Um, so we're going to jump forwards a little bit. I don't know if you're bored, but I am. So let's go get rid of that, get rid of that. Another little slice. And pop that out of the way. Okay, so I can just stop him here. So what we've done now is we've now we've got a nice space where we can easily slide through. It's quite difficult to get through that, that channel to start with, even though that our camera is only four millimeters in, in diameter. It's now much easier to advance through there. And we're looking up now, bear in mind, this is a superficial flex tendon. If this, was a, if this was a hind leg, what we might often expect to see, especially in cobs, native types, is this flap of tissue here, which is called the manica flexoria. It's another of the structures that's evolved since uh, Andrew and I both qualified. It didn't exist when we were students. Um, but this is a, a very favored thing for, uh, for, as I say, particularly more native types to tear that. And, and that can be really uncomfortable. It's a bit like having a split nail. While it's there flapping around in the breeze, every time they take a step, it gets caught. And so this is nice and normal. If it tears, then uh, the, the best way to resolve that is actually to remove it. Um, nobody's quite sure its purpose in life, really. It's one of the many parts of the horse that evolved purely to vet, help vets pay their mortgages. So we remove uh, that, that torn tissue completely. And those will do really well um, with, uh, with that surgery. A really good number of those will go back to, back to full work. We'll also we'll just have a quick look up there. And then we'll also look at the other tendons within um, here. The, uh, if it was a forelimb, you're more likely to see tearing of the, the outside of that deep flexor, which is under here, which is looking up under the manica flexoria. I'll just jump forwards a little bit because what I will do after this this is sort of the, the full extent of the, the time of the surgery. I just take the camera out and then I'm going to pop it back in from the other hole, speed through here. And then we're going to look down, all the way down to the bottom of the tendon sheath. So this is the back of Paston here. Um, and again, deep flex tendon. We're just looking at the branches of the superficial here. We're having a quick scoot around, make sure we're not seeing any other, any other torn um, tendon, making sure we haven't got any, any adhesions, everything's moving nicely. Um, come back, have a look, a look at our cut annular ligament here, which you can see is, is kind of sprung apart. Actually, it's probably the best part of a centimeter sprung apart there. So you've given yourself quite a lot of extra space for those tendons to slide through. And that's the end of that. So that, that's essentially what we do in, in tendon sheaths. It's a really common thing. Um, as I say, much more common in more native types than in hind limbs, but does happen in forelimbs and more likely to be a, a tendon injury in a forelimb, which unfortunately does carry a slightly worse prognosis. It's, um, it's another one of those ops that I really like coming in because um, the people are, I'd say 90% of people that have this particular op done, annual ligament desmotomy, they, they're delighted with the results, aren't they? 
Um, it's not like a salvage op. It's an op that makes horses go on and compete. So um, I'm, I love seeing those horses coming in. Um, but sometimes with the arthroscopy, that's not the case, is it, when we're actually looking in joints? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is the great advantage that you essentially fix the problem and that, you know, for a good number of them, the, there is no long term knock on effect from it. Whereas when you're dealing with joints, sometimes by the time we get to see the joint, it's already at the top of a slippery downward slope. And essentially what we're often doing in that situation is doing our best to stop it from getting any worse or at least slowing its deterioration. Um, and this will be a classic example. So this is a, a, a radiograph of a horse's knee. Um, we don't forget, we're weird horsey people. We call it his knee. It's actually his wrist. Um, uh, and so if you look, this is the, the radius coming down here and there's a, there's a big beaky bit there. So that is, that's actually a, a fragment. In fact, it's a little collection of fragments there. So that's what it looks like on the, on the X-ray. This is a common injury for race horses, but we do see it in other sorts as well. Um, and that will, if we, we click on a little bit, We'll look into the joint, exactly the same process of looking into a joint with keyhole surgery. So this is looking across the surface of that, of that radius. The horse is obviously on his back. So we're looking down on, the, uh, on that. Lovely smooth cartilage and um, issues here. This, this is the lining of the joint here at the front. And in a minute, there we go. There's my needle coming in just to make sure we're in the right place. And you can see this little piece of cartilage and bone, you know, I, I can flick it with a needle and it's loose. So horse running along with that, partly a little bit that's a stone in your shoe, that's uncomfortable. But also as this gets flapped around, what you'll see in a minute if you watch carefully, we're using this as a, as a marker so we, we can then make our next little hole to get our instruments through. Come on Crow, hurry up with it. And um, jump forwards a little bit. There's our blade coming through. And then we start to have a little dig around. There it is. Okay, so if you look at that, what, you, may not, you may not project well enough, but you'll see little showers of it, what's actually essentially bone dust coming out of here. And that's a really bad thing to have floating around in your joint. It's really, really good at promoting inflammation in the joint. And the process that that leads to cause, causes a lot of damage, chemical damage, essentially, to the cartilage around it. And that, the reason we wanted to treat these early is to stop that process before it's really become irreversible. We're just getting some little nibblers in here. We've just, just lifted that off. And then because it's really crummy loose stuff, sometimes this will come out, it's really satisfying. It just comes out of one piece. And other times like this, it's really crumbly soft stuff. It's like soft coral, really. Um, and you end up just kind of taking it out in, in little bits, getting rid of all of that. It's, it's, never going to get, it's never going to heal. These are fractures that, it, it is a fracture. It's never going to heal because it's constantly being nudged so that that won't get better. So we have to remove that. Um, and then as and when we've got rid of most of that, I think I got bored of videoing um, towards the end, but basically what we will then do is give the surface of the bone here, this fracture line, we're still digging out crumbly rubbish from down here, but we'll give the surface of the bone here a really good scrape to remove any loose stuff. So it will then form a, uh, a fibrous heel over that. And because you're essentially dealing with a divot, the, the, the little bit of bone above that um, can just get on and do its job. You remove the inflammatory process. It obviously, the, the joint has to have a bit of time to recover. It's not sort of take the stitches out two weeks later and stick them straight back into training. But th these ones will have a generally a, a, a really good prognosis for a, a return to full function, back into racing, and then hopefully a you know, good long life afterwards as well uh, without this being an issue for them going forwards. Not all horses are quite as lucky as this. Sometimes by the time that the fragment comes off, it's quite a degenerate joint. And so those sometimes are a bit more salvage like or, or you know, can be then retired to do something less, you know, less exertion or a, a discipline that do, does less damage to, to horses' knees. So that's the sort of thing that we, we look at with arthroscopy in terms of moving, removing fragments. There are other fragments caused not necessarily by trauma, but by developmental problems. Um, and those, are, those can be really nice to treat as well because they are essentially as the, as the foal's bone grows, they get these little weak spots, which result from the uh, failure of the process of conversion from cartilage to bone as that bone grows. And again, we tend to see those really early in the course of events. So when they're still babies, essentially, you know, one and two year olds quite often as warm bloods and, and obviously compared to thoroughbreds, thoroughbreds, a three year old thoroughbreds can be quite, is quite old. A three year old warm blood is a baby. So you can treat those um, it, it, before they become a problem, before they start to injure the joint. So essentially you're, you're treating it before it's caused the problem. And again, those can be really satisfying. They can, you, you know, the, you can be reasonably confident they're going to go on and have a very long 
career doing that. And this, just a, a quick video here of uh, another traumatic injury to a joint. Um, it looks a bit like some sort of weird seaweed. What this is actually is a, is a torn ligament in a horse's hock joint. So this is all the fibers of that, of that ligament sort of blown apart into the joint. And the problem with these is the body doesn't have any way to get rid of them. And this, the, the stuff that makes this fight these fibrils up is called collagen, really important stuff, really good at causing inflammation. And also you've got this torn tissue again, snagging as the horse moves. So it's just promoting uh, pain and inflammation within the joint. So our job is to go and essentially remove all of that, reestablish a normal lining to the joint or almost normal lining, so that's all covered over. And again, the, these do really well. They, they're often very, very lame to start with for a, for a few days. They're left with this huge bog spab, and it's a big swollen hock that although they get significantly more comfortable, they tend to stay lame. And, and again, they can be really satisfying because uh, you know, a really good number of these will just get better um, once you've removed all that. But essentially the cause of that inflammation and pain, you can just get rid of it, give the, give the joint a, a chance to heal up, and bobs your uncle back to work. So, Ollie, you make that look very, very easy. And um, I know that on training courses, they quite often make you use a pepper. <laughs> Not you, <laughs> if we and it's it's impossible. I mean, it's it's really hard. You've made that look really easy. There's a there's a couple of questions that have come in. I've answered quite a lot of them as we've gone along because I knew that we were running out of time because we're almost at an hour now. Um, but there's a couple that I think it's important that you perhaps answer. And one is um, Sandra has um, asked, was the kissing spine op that was shown called a ligament snip or is that something different? So that's that's slightly different, actually. Um, I'm just looking for the Zoom to unshare my screen. Um, so, no, it's slightly different from that. Um, it, in, and in reality, it's probably the difference is probably not that huge. So the ligament slip, you're just cutting the ligament between those uh, between those bits of bone. And with, what we do is to remove a sliver of bone so that it, it's no longer kind of you're essentially creating space. So rather than rather than that, you've got that. Um, whereas a ligament split is just literally just splitting the ligament between the two. And the idea of that is that you make it easier for the horse to keep those apart. Um, and as it's a different technique. We don't, we definitely don't have good evidence for one necessarily being better than the other. And in time, probably we'll find that some work better for some horses and some work better for other. I tend to just do those. I think in the sort of case though that we see, we tend to see ones like that one, which has a, a lot of bony reaction around it. And there's really no or little or no uh, ligament left. Um, so we we aim to, um, as I say, create space and, and leave it well spaced. Um, but it's a, it's a fractionally different one from that. And um, sorry, one more question. We I think we literally are going to lose our spot in, a, in about a minute or so. So I'm so sorry if we haven't answered everything. But um, if people could maybe put down what they're interested in, we'll consider doing another evening if I can get Ollie organised. Um, <laughs> But um, one other question that I just thought was interesting was um, someone's got a horse that's got degenerative suspensory desmitis. Um, and is there anything that could be done about that? The fetlocks are actually dropping. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately not. That, that's one of those really. So having said that it's very rare for, for those ligaments to, to actually fail, um, there are um, there are a small number of horses where that is unfortunately what happens is that slowly they just don't stand up to the to to the weight of the horse and cut sadly at the moment the, the place they see it most in southern us where they deal with um tennessee walking horses and a, and a few horses like that where it, that's quite common and sadly there isn't there isn't a solution apart from reducing the exercise as much rest as possible and hope you get enough scar tissue yeah so that's so so from what i understand as you know as a gp vet once the actual structure has stretched and is damaged there's nothing that's going to unstretch it but if the issue is that it's painful then we can sort that out but so that's the early doors the other ones a different problem isn't it it's much later yeah and the, the, the ones that are um, where they're failing as well they're really not good candidates for those ones aren't the good candidates for surgery they're, they're no. ones for conservative management because they are the ones where if, you, if they can't feel it they'll just use it more and it'll fall apart more yeah okay um and one other i know that i'm just i know that we're going to get cut off any second here um someone's just saying what's the success rate regarding um kissing spine surgery for horses returning to work so uh, in in the uh, so it's a, it's short answer 77 percent of horses that just have kissing spine will go back to work and stay in work 
Um, it's about 55% if they have other orthopedic issues, so other causes, other causes of lameness, a, any other issues with their backs. Um, that's sort of the, the, the headline figure for those. Brilliant. Yeah, that's good. I, Ollie, I think we're going to have to wrap up there, unfortunately, because um, I think I've actually found someone who is chattier than me. <laughs> <laughs> so next time we're gonna to have to get a quiet person allowed rather than two yeah. people um so i'm so sorry if we haven't answered all your questions but thank you so much Ollie. that was really interesting i'm sorry to watch you yeah, it's always good to have a time limit especially when i'm involved yes <laughs> well i didn't like to say but thank you so much no problems